National University is actually fulfilling the 3% quota. I don't know how many of you know, but uh, Delhi University has around 1300 seats every year for people with disabilities too. But uh, sadly, only around 600 to 700 seats get fulfilled every year because not, there are not enough number of applicants who are people with disabilities. So it's great that firstly the administration is ensuring that the quota is fulfilled and secondly you guys are ensuring an enabling attitude through the enabled committee that you guys have started. So when you, when you guys invited me to National Law University, I thought uh, you guys are lawyers, so you guys obviously know disability law, etc. better than me. So instead of me talking about policy or law, it might be better that I share my own life story which and make it more automatically through which uh, you guys might realize uh, the day-to-day -day challenges that people with disabilities face. And I would like to speak for only around 10 to 12 minutes and follow it up with question and answers because I think that's much more interesting than me just giving a monologue. So, I was born on uh, 1st of September 1987 and uh, when I was uh, born, this was 8 years before even India had a disability law. It was since the Disability Act came up, came up in 1995 of course. And uh, that's when I was taken out of my mother's womb. I was born with fractures and my body was completely blue. And uh, a lot of orthopedics were immediately called to see this specimen who was just born because people did not really know how to react to a child who was born with a disability. And uh, when doctors saw me, most of them came up with a very gloom and doom prognosis saying that uh, one actually told my parents that this boy is going to live the life of a wooden doll. Another actually told my parents that uh, Maybe it's worth keeping him alive because his neck is straight. Uh, third said, uh, we don't really know what future this guy entails. Because what I was born with was this disability called arthrodiposis, which basically means that the muscles in my arms and limbs were not fully developed and they would not develop throughout the lifetime. But instead of giving an objective opinion, which I guess they, even they did not have because of lack of disability literature in India at that time, they come, came across these uh, negative prognoses. However, what was the changing point in my parents' lives was when there was this uh, one local doctor who told my mother that uh, even though a child is born with a disability, he's never going to give, uh, deprive you of the joys of parenthood. And I, thought, I think that really was the changing point of my life because it was after that moment that my parents realized that uh, our son can have a completely normal life too despite his disability. And they made sure that they, would, that, that they would give me a normal life after that. The first few years of my life were filled with operations, injections and tough decisions. I went through various corrective surgeries in my hands and legs. And thus, uh, I missed out on most, most of nursery and kindergarten. And uh, when it was time to enroll me in school, I was around 4 years old by then, my parents decided that they want to send me to a normal school. And uh, the reasoning behind that was that Eventually, I'm going to need a normal life and face the normal challenges in life. So, why not send our child to a normal school? However, uh, unfortunately, most schools in India at that time uh, had a very, uh, there was a big social stigma against disability even in the intellectual field. And uh, schools feared that other children would not have, would not want a disabled child around them. And secondly, the schools also did not want the headache of having with a child of, with a disability in the school. And uh, my parents went through rejections in around 20 schools. They did not have any legal backing until one school finally decided to select me for luckily because it chose to see what I had and not what I did not have. School life for me, of course, was again not easy. And one of the main reasons for that was, of course, uh, because children did not really know how to react to the physical disability, I think. And I don't blame children because I think at that age, children fear approaching anybody who is slightly different and of course I do completely look different, won't I? So they did not want to interact with me etc. And uh, even teachers in school did not really uh, know how to treat a child with a disability. I have often had this experience that there were some teachers who treated me with sympathy which was again bad because I always say that people with disabilities need empathy and not sympathy and what sympathy does is that it distances you even more from your peers and classmates. And there were other teachers who completely ignored my existence. So. I had teachers at two extreme sides other than teachers treating me like completely normal human beings. However, uh, when I was in school, I wanted to make the most of all extracurricular activities, etc. And uh, I remember my school uh, had a very famous, uh, very big theatre. I was in APJ School Noida, which has a huge theatre. I don't know, if, is anyone of you from APJ School Noida or from Noida the city? Yet? No? Okay. But uh, APJ School Noida is the biggest auditorium in the entire city of Noida. so it's. 
the school is famous for that auditorium and our school's flagship event was this uh, play that the school used to host every year. And uh, the first year I actually landed up for auditions but because I wanted to participate in, in the play. And uh, unfor unfortunately for me, the school was creating a play on Milka Singh. Now, of course, cannot run as fast as Milka Singh and thus I was rejected from the play. But uh, I did not give up. The next year, I landed up for auditions again. This time, India just won the Kargil War and India and the school wanted to celebrate the Kargil War heroes. And, uh, and yet I was again rejected because I obviously don't look like a soldier. But I persisted. And the third year, actually, the teacher actually told me that Nepal, your persistence is counted and you're going to be on stage throughout the two hours of the play. And I was elated. I was going to be on stage for longer than the main actor or the main actress. Because I was on the set of the play as a tree. So that was quite uh, funny. But uh, at the same time, I really enjoyed that experience also. Another thing that I did in school is that uh, I loved writing. And uh, I wanted to be a cricket commentator because I loved cricket like most boys. And uh, I felt that the best way for me to be associated with cricket is to be a cricket commentator. So I actually went about to interview Harsha Bhogle. I tracked him down, interviewed him. And wrote a cover story for my school magazine, a very cheeky one, which... I'm kind of uh, ashamed of now, but I actually wrote one saying how I would be a better commentator in cricket than Harsha Bhogle. Uh, apart from that, uh, I fell in love with books because I wasn't really uh, involved in extracurricular activities and uh, so I carried a book with me everywhere. Today, the, the Kindle has replaced the book, but there's always something behind my wheelchair, either a book or a Kindle or something. And soon, I was the most well-read boy in class. And uh, by the time the class 10th more results came out, I actually topped my school scoring 87% and I think uh, that was the turning point in my life. After that, uh, I had officially become the nerd of the class and even though I did not have any friends, my phone was constantly ringing because there were people wanting to know how to solve a sum or how to find an answer to something etc. So I did get socially promoted up one level at least. And the second thing that happened is that I got a lot of media coverage because it always makes for a great story that a boy on a beach has scored 87%. And it was then that I actually promised my parents that uh, one day I'll be on the front pages of newspapers. And uh, luckily for me, I didn't have to wait too long because in class 12th, I talked business studies and I was a country, to country topper scoring 98 and I was on the front pages of newspapers. So that uh, is the proudest moment of my life. However, uh, each uh, success is of course followed by a challenge for persons with disability as I've shared so far. Uh, the year was 2005 when I graduated from my class 12th and I wanted to go to the best of colleges. However, unfortunately most colleges in Delhi University were not accessible at all to people with disabilities. And I applied with a lot of disillusionment and uh, realizing that most colleges are not accessible, I took a shortcut in life and it was the first time in my life that I was taking a shortcut. I went and enrolled in this private college for an integrated BBA and I actually studied in the private college for a year. I was stopping exams, I was doing very well academically but I wasn't really satisfied because I wasn't being challenged academically and uh, I decided to go against the norm and actually quit that college in one and a half year and reapply applied to Delhi University and in 2007 I applied to St. Stephen's for the economic honors program, something I'd always wanted to study even in 2005. And uh, my princi the principal of the college was of course impressed by my credentials etc. But he told me one thing that the economics classroom has been on the first floor for 125 years. And for one person we cannot really shift it down. So are you ready to go up one floor every day? And uh, what he heard was a resounding yes. I did not want to take any shortcut. And for four days I actually went up one floor every day. I used to take two weight lifters along with me too lift my wheelchair physically up and take it up on floor every day. Of course it was a physical threat, my parents thought I gone mad, but I wanted the best of education. And uh, within four days, the college actually shifted the economics classroom down. And this was a historic moment for the college itself too, because economics classrooms had never been on the ground floor for this college. And when my parents went to thank the college, they said it's Nippon's persistence that did it. When I was in St. Stephen's, I also founded the enabling cell, which did some similar stuff to what I guess you guys are doing. I would love to know more about what your vision is for the enabling committee uh, here. I was also the founder of the entrepreneurship cell. And uh, it was in St. Stephen's that I really met friends for the first time in my life. And I felt like just another 
evening, I used to pump classes, I used to get drunk at night, I used to do everything. You guys do, I'm sure. I've heard energy parties are great, so. Are they? No? Okay. Stephen was better than me. But, uh, but by the time uh, I, was, uh, I was about to graduate from a third year, I decided to go to Delhi School of Economics because most of my friends from Stephen's were going to Delhi School of Economics. And I still don't know why I actually applied for a master, but since I did, I'll tell you the story. And uh, when I was applying, there were a lot of people who were slogging. And uh, I heard whispers from some people saying, Iska to physically challenged quota mein ho jayega. And I'm not saying a physically challenged quota is wrong. I, By the way, I did get into St. Stephen's through a physically challenged quota, and I have no problem in saying that. But uh, when when I was marked like this, saying that Iska physically challenged quota mein ho jayega in Delhi School of Economics, what I felt is that they felt I don't deserve to be in college. And I wanted to prove those people who were saying that wrong. And I actually locked myself in my room for three months towards my end of St. Stephen's talking the DSE entrance. And when the entrance results came out, I'd actually scored the 52nd rank nationally and I'd actually defeated those friends. So that was another proud moment for me. Uh, but uh, I think Delhi School of Economics is actually the most important role in my life. Uh, because when I was in Delhi School of Economics, I decided to sit for placements and uh, follow the herd mentality, which everybody else in my class was really doing, sitting for placements. I don't know why people go to study a master in economics if they want placements, they should rather go to MBA, but we all were doing master in economics, but we wanted jobs in the corporate sector. And uh, so I went, and I think I faced three most humiliating months of my life at that particular point of time. And I think that's what actually gave me a direction in life to be what I am today. I went through multiple rounds of interviews with a wide variety of organizations uh, where uh, it was the disability that was looked at and not Nipun Malhotra. There was one company that actually made me go through seven rounds of interviews because denying me a job because they said they don't have a disability friendly toilet. I don't know why they made me go through seven rounds in the first place in that case. There was another that actually said that uh, we don't trust your CV and we don't think you can sit for eight hours on a wheelchair on a daily basis. There was a third that uh, actually said that uh, we don't really think you've ever read a book. What I'm basically trying to say is that there were a wide variety of companies that came up with very creative excuses on why not to select me. And uh, this, this was one of the most disappointing periods of my life. I was locked up in my room for a couple of months after this. And actually even started bending down my obituary. But uh, what I realized during these moments is that uh, I'm lucky that uh, my father's a businessman and I come from a position of strength compared to a lot of many people. And that's what inspired me to start the Nippan Foundation in 2012. And I won't get too much into self-promotion. I'll just briefly speak about it in two minutes and then open it up for Q&A or TA, whatever you like. Uh, the Nippan Foundation was started uh, to concentrate on the three pillars of life, that is, health, dignity, and happiness for persons with disabilities. And uh, when I started off, my primary focus was persons with disabilities in the private sector and it inclusion of persons with disabilities in it. And I've conducted various workshops, accessibility audits, ensuring private sector companies become accessible both in terms of the physical infrastructure and the attitude. I also founded the Nippon Foundation Equal Opportunity Awards in 2014, through which we are trying to build an ecosystem of like-minded companies that promote equal opportunity. And uh, we're doing it in a very professional way with EN as an audit partner, we have former Secretary General of Wiki as a jury chair, etc. Apart from that, we are also concentrating on happiness of persons with disabilities because what I feel is that they are complete individuals and uh, people with disabilities have the right to party as hard as anybody. So, we are the accessibility partners of the NN7 <coughs> Weekend Festival, we are the access partners of the Jaipur Literary Festival. Uh, there is an arts uh, event called the Serendipity Arts Festival that is happening in December in Goa this year. And, uh, we worked with them not only to make the physical infrastructure accessible, but even the entire content accessible to various disabilities. So that's another focus area that I have concentrated on. And uh, just earlier this month, we launched another, another campaign called Wheels for Life. And uh, through Wheels for Life, what we are doing is that we, we are connecting people who need a wheelchair to anyone who can donate a wheelchair. In 5,000 rupees, a person can actually gift a wheelchair to someone. How it basically works is that uh, if somebody wants to donate a wheelchair, they can just go online and donate 5,000 rupees. And we'll actually identify a beneficiary or we have partner NGOs across Delhi and CR right now and we plan to expand it all over the country who will identify beneficiaries or even if somebody directly wants a wheelchair, they can just 
log in and fit in a simple form and each of it be delivered to their house. Because uh, I feel there are huge number of, I know how wheelchair changed my life and uh, I want to help as many people who need a wheelchair as, they can, as I can through my capital needs for life. So that's about my life story. I, and before I conclude, I actually want to talk about another incident that happened in March last year. I was actually about to enter a South Delhi restaurant in an evening. And I was actually denied entry because of my disability. And it was uh, a humiliating experience for me because I also joined a group of friends who were already inside. And uh, when you told you cannot enter a restaurant because you're disabled, it's shocking. Uh, but what I decided to do is that instead of staying quiet, I decided to tweet about the incident and before I knew it, it started trending on Twitter, uh, media channels on my doorstep the next day, the Delhi government ordered an inquiry that came out in my favourite sector. So, well that was great, but what I also realised during this incident is that uh, I actually remember one moment where a radio jockey called me up and she broke down on the phone saying that I was actually denied entry with the same restaurant because I was getting an Indian dress. And that really makes me start questioning the uh, Indian culture and values. Have we, to be defined as cool, have we really lost ourselves and now people judge because either because they're disabled or not disabled, because they're wearing something of a particular attire or because of their particular gender or their particular sexuality. I think uh, the enabling committee of your college is doing a great, it's a, it's a first step but I'm sure it'll do a great job in including, including people with disabilities. I hope all of you when you become lawyers in the future can Make sure India becomes an equal opportunity country for all. Thank you. So yes, I'll speak for 10 minutes instead of speaking for 20. So. Thank you for a wonderfully inspiring talk, Mr. Nishwan. Um, and like he mentioned in the beginning, he wants this to be more of an interactive session. So please ask any questions that you have regarding his talk, anything that you think he, you want to know more about, please. Yeah, Ashley. Uh, what can we, so you are taking initiatives and many people are taking uh, private places, uh, for making uh, private places accessible. What about say uh, public transport? I public buses or if they are then railways. So I am actually glad you raised that question because uh, in December last year, I don't know whether you remember, uh, the Delhi government introduced this odd even uh, campaign to control pollution and when they started this odd even campaign, around two weeks before this campaign, a lot of people in the disability community really panicked because uh, they realized that uh, what odd even might be the, for somebody like you and alternates public transport day for a person with a disability will be an alternate day where you are forced to stay at home because public transport is not accessible at all. Mm -hmm. And it was around 20 of us that actually wrote letters to the Delhi government requesting the Delhi government to exempt people with disabilities. And what often happens is that the disabled community is forgotten because it's not, they don't, the, the government doesn't see it as that big an electoral factor. And I actually had to file a public interest litigation to get the disabled exempt from or even. And it was around that time that I actually did a show with CNN IV and I wish I would have carried video recordings of that but I actually travelled all over the city with a camera to see how accessible Delhi is for, uh, in terms of public transport for people with disabilities. And what was shocking to hear is that uh, less than half of Delhi's buses are low-flow buses. Low-flow buses are the buses that have ramps. But what's worse is that even those half that are low-flow buses, either the ramp is broken in those buses because it's not maintained properly or the ramp is jammed because it has never been opened so it's unusable. Conductors have never been trained so they don't know how to use those low flow buses. Uh, the second thing in Delhi is the Delhi Metro. Now the Delhi Metro is something which is completely accessible and one of the main reasons why it is accessible is because at the beginning, Mr. E. Shridhar and many other vision for the Delhi Metro decided that he wants to make it accessible and I think uh, any public transport or any infrastructure, any building if you decide in the beginning itself that you want to make it ex uh, accessible, it's much easier than retrofitting something. And in fact, uh, if you are make, if you're working towards accessibility while creating something, it does access the accessibility cost is less than one percent of the project cost of that entire building. Whereas that will be much more if you retrofit something. And that's why the Delhi Metro is a big success story. However, the Delhi Metro would never really provide you last mile coverage, unlike uh, a bus or a taxi or something. 
So Delhi doesn't even have any wheelchair accessible taxis. And when uh, Stephen Hawking had come to Delhi, I remember the Delhi government panicked and had started calling up various disability rights activists saying that can somebody arrange a wheelchair accessible taxi or something for them because they were so embarrassed that a VIP is coming. So I guess uh, this country only wakes up when a Stephen Hawking or somebody comes up. But uh, the public transport in Delhi itself, if it's so sad, you can just imagine how it is in the rest of the country. Because I don't think Indian Railways has anything which is disabled. Sorry? Indian Railways. So in Indian Railways, what has happened is that they've started concentrating on making uh, the newer railway stations accessible. But unless the railway coaches are accessible and a person with a disability can e easily get into a railway coach, the only use of a railway station being accessible is for you to go and greet somebody who's coming down a train, which is okay. Uh, first of all, thank you Nipun for that wonderful talk. Um, thank you for sharing your experiences. It is really sad and unfortunate that, you know, you're right when you say that the government and the country only wakes up when Stephen Hawking is uh, visiting. But my question is about a recent initiative by the government, by the union government, which is Accessible India campaign that was started some, I think, a year back. Uh, do you think it, it relates to manufacturing sector and how uh, a group of people which was left behind has now been, it's an attempt to include them in this manufacturing sector. Do you think this should also, instead of just having it in the cottage industry or government industry, should also be extended to the private sector? And is the Accessible India campaign actually working? Uh, so I'll tell you two things about the Accessible India campaign, both the good and the bad. The good about the Accessible India campaign is that uh, because the Prime Minister launched it and there was a lot of noise around it, at least there's a discussion or a debate around disability that has finally started in this country. Though be, the Prime Minister calls people with disabilities Divyang or Divine and I'm very against that term because I enjoy my cocktail too and I don't think I'm divine in any way. But uh, at the same time, I'm glad he started the campaign because people are at least talking about disability and college students know about it, the media knows about it, it's become slightly maybe glamorous to talk about disability. However, my biggest criticism of the Access to India campaign at, that, at the same time is the lack of ambition that the campaign shows. So the Access to India campaign is only encouraging, uh, the goal of the government is to make 100 government buildings in 50 cities of the country accessible through the Access to India campaign. And I think government buildings should be accessible in any way. You don't need to start a campaign to make government buildings accessible. I've actually written extensively about how the Access to India campaign could have worked with the private sector too and uh, there are small tweaks that in policy that can really impact uh, how this country is made accessible. For example, if a commercial enterprise is set up, you require a completion certificate, requires a fire NOC and other no mission certificates. Why not have a small amendment that uh, when, when there's a commercial enterprise of a particular size, have an accessibility NOC too, so that it cannot be set up if it's large without being accessible. Now, talk, not talking about small things, that's why there needs to be some threshold right? above a certain level if there's an investment, it has to be accessible. Uh, the second thing the government could have done is that it could have encouraged corporates to use the CSR funds to encourage uh, accessibility or inclusion of people with disabilities, maybe through the training or something in some way. Uh, like for example, with the accessibility <coughs> campaign, today if I am the CEO of Coca-Cola or any other MNC, I can actually use my CSR funds to donate uh, to government infrastructure to make it, own, make it accessible, but I can't use my CSR funds to make my own building accessible. And now I understand why there is that uh, ethical dilemma that a corporate should not be allowed to use their own CSR funds to make, to amend their own corporate building, etc. But I do believe that, uh, especially when it comes to corporates, you need to give both a carrot and a stick. So if you give them a carrot that uses CSR funds to make their own building accessible, what will happen tomorrow is that another nipple will not be rejected from a job because that corporate doesn't have a disabled friendly toilet. So I'm quite okay with corporates, to be very honest, using CSR funds to make themselves accessible. So, that, does that answer your question? Yeah. Just to add to that, uh, another problem that the government, uh, that not just this government, and I'm not really attacking this particular government, but I'm attacking governments in India generally in, in the past, is that disability has been looked at in a stylo and not, uh, you know, throughout the entire system. For example, there's also a smart city campaign that has started. Why not uh, put accessible in India under the smart city campaign rather than have it as a separate campaign? And ensure those smart cities are accessible cities, because if a city is not accessible, I don't think how it's smart. Can you use the mic, please? Yeah. So, with, specifically with regards to Delhi Metro, 
uh, how do people like general public when it comes to making the station accessible and the uh, metro itself how do people behave because i think it would be a bit even if the uh, facilities are there i guess people being sensitive or people uh, i don't know people being sensitive would if people are not sensitive it would actually affect the facilities that are present at the stations or in the metro so my question would be to what extent do people who use uh, these like how do people behave in terms of uh, being sensitive in specifically in terms of public transport i think uh, i've had diverse experiences yeah i've had great experiences and bad experiences but i think that's a challenge which everybody faces and i don't think that's generally for people with disabilities when they're traveling with the delhi metro of course uh, in general uh, sensitization is extremely important and uh, one of the things that needs to be done is that sensitization needs to start early and school curriculums need to have stories of maybe two or three inspiring people with disabilities or disabled achievers so that that change happens there. I don't think you can do much with somebody who is going on a metro and is 40 years old and is rushing for a job to sensitize him or her on how to react to a person with a disability. But uh, one funny thing about the Delhi metro is that uh, the Delhi metro has always had a seat reserved for a wheelchair and unfortunately over the last few years the seat reserved for a wheelchair has been in the ladies coach. So I don't really know whether they consider people with disabilities as asexual or whether they think only ladies on wheelchairs travel, but that's just an interesting preview. Um, I had an observation and a question. So observation being that regarding the buildings that should be made accessible on your accessible India campaign, I think the first important thing they should do is make at least the courts more accessible. And this happened because me and my friend we were recently visiting like the consumer forum in the district consumer forum in Janapuri which is located at this absurd location where you even common people have difficulty reaching that and it will be a complete nightmare for someone who is disabled to reach that. So that was completely stopped to see that kind of an oblivious attitude from the government. So it's just an addition to that. No, and I completely agree with you and uh, you're talking about this obscure court. Even the Delhi High Court is not completely yeah, exactly. accessible. Not, I have fought a lot of cases in the Delhi High Court, a lot of years and uh, I faced my own challenges because uh, the place where you go to get your ticket to register yeah. to get in, that has steps. And always have to send somebody else. And uh, for somebody like me who likes to do everything myself, I find that quite annoying. So. Yeah, so I think that should have been their primary agenda, at least to make the courts more accessible. The other question that I wanted to ask you is what do you think generally about the legal framework under which disability in India operates? Sorry, can you repeat that question? Yeah, what is your general take on the broader legal framework under which disability in India like operates? Like, I haven't read much of the disability law. So okay, so right now what we have is the Persons with Disability Act, yeah. 1995 that is in motion and it is quite a toothless act. And the reason why I say it is toothless is because uh, even though something like uh, firstly there are only seven disabilities in India that are actually recognized under that particular act and even things like autism could not get a, dis somebody with autism would get a mental retardation disability certificate under that act in 2005 till that there was this one lady who fought against it and got autism recognized and even though she, she fought to have that eight disability recognized there are so many other disabilities that are still not recognized in this one in the country today uh, the second thing is that india is actually a signatory to the un convention for rights of persons with disability which was released in 2007 and india was one of the first countries that signed it so india is actually violating a un convention that it has signed by not having a better law so the second problem with the 1995 law is that uh, it talks about the 3% quota for people with disabilities that I'm sure you've heard of. However, uh, any government uh, organization can easily uh, skip that 3% quota if they actually manage justifying how, you know, how not only the fact that uh, they did not get enough applicants, even if they get enough applicants, they can actually say that those applicants were not medically fit and get away. Now, person with a disability is obviously not supposed to be medically fit, so I don't really know how government organizations are getting away, but that's the truth. I don't know whether you've heard of Ira Singhal, the lady who talked to the IS two years back. The sad truth is that she'd actually cleared the IS exam around five or six years back, but she was denied uh, a posting because the medical examination board said that she's not medically fit to be an IS officer. And I know tons of such people who faced such problems. If you go to JNU, you find a lot of PhD students with disabilities who Actually, I joined JNU because I wanted to join the civil services. They even cracked the exam. 
whether with the, with or without quota, but they could not get postings because the medical board stopped the postings. So there, there are tons of such examples. Apart from that, uh, if any government building is not made ex accessible, or any government department is not made accessible, something that the Persons with Disability Act suggests that they should be made accessible. There's no penalty that can be taken against them for not being accessible at the same time. So I think accessibility and employment and education, these are the three things that the government needs to concentrate the most on, especially with physical disabilities. Of course, with mental disabilities, there are of course a wide variety of other challenges that come up and I'm not really an expert in that area. But uh, so these, all these three things, uh, there's no legal binding on the government under the current law. In, an America, in a place like America, under the American Disability Act, even if a star, small Starbucks is not accessible, you can actually sue them and become a millionaire overnight. They will make themselves accessible to avoid it. So, sir, I'm sure that you've looked into the laws regarding persons with disabilities in other countries. Is there something in specific that you wish would be uh, a part of the Indian law about persons with disabilities? So, I think the American Disabilities Act is an extremely strong act in that sense. Uh, it was started in 1990 and in 2008 it was further improved. And the interesting thing is that uh, they were both Republicans, the guy who introduced it and the guy who approved it further. So hopefully a right-wing party in India will do magic also. Let's keep fingers crossed. But uh, yeah, I think uh, the American Disabilities Act is an act which India should learn from and implement as much from as possible. Uh, so is there something specific in it which makes it I guess better than other acts. I think it is not toothless. You are legally, it's you are you are legally forced to do things as both an organization or as a government department, or as a school or an education institution, etc. Tomorrow you can go to court and say that uh, if a school denies entry to a person with a disability, or even if a restaurant says that I, I do not want a person with a disability inside, etc. You actually have legal protection <coughs> to ensure that you get things done. Uh, sir. Uh, first of all, thank you for giving such an amazing like, food you tell, not good about here. So my question is regarding like when a person, I am a person with disability basically. So people used to judge you on it, like if you are less, your disability can't be visible. People is like they don't don't take a, a minute to like judge you. They say that he looks fine and he is now like taking a disability quota. So sir. Like if you, even if you try to aware make people aware, nobody want to like do like uh, if you give it a name of sensitization, people think that they are uh, sensitized by their like by them like as per their knowledge. But my question is like how to tackle such kind of uh, like issues? How can you like make people aware when they uh, deny to be like attend such kind of uh, like? But like with AQ, if you organize a kind of event, they deny to attend. And uh, my second question is regarding to that, uh, like, uh, it, it is quite, uh, what we say, like, it is quite unexpressible to uh, tell yourself what, like, what you face in your life. And like being a disabled candidate and people, People even in the like when you study in the law college and there is no awareness in that college. How can you like even think about surviving in that college when people don't know about what how the person should be treated as a being a disabled? So I don't I'm not going to give you a policy answer to that, but I'm going to give you a personal answer instead. Because I mean policies will take years to come in, etc. And you would have graduated by then. And uh, maybe you will be creating the policy by that time, you're a lawyer. But uh, I actually think that uh, in life, what, I'm, what, I'm, what my lesson in life has been is that uh, if somebody is an irritant and he doesn't understand you, there's up to a, really a, up to a point really that you can try and change them. And if you don't change, I think you're wasting your own time by giving them rent-free occupation in your mind. So it's better to ignore those kind of people and move on in life and be strong. And uh, the second thing uh, that I want to tell you is that something that I often say, uh, and do you understand Hindi? Yeah, so, you know, I always say that Takneef to sabki hoti hai farak sirap yeh yeh ki meri dikhti hai Or dikhti nahi hai And I think that's something you should remember in your life too Everybody has a problem and Maybe they are going through their own challenges And that's why they are not Empathizing with you, etc. And uh, 
up to a point try it, but then after that, I think you move on, yeah, you are stronger than them. And I wanted to add one more point to your question. You mentioned the, I mentioned the American Disability Act and I don't want you all to feel that, you know, it's only a Western country that can come up with a stronger law. Nepal recently had a new constitution and they actually leapfrogged to something better than the Indian law. And uh, for example, uh, Nepal actually has provision for caretakers for people with disabilities in their own law, which India doesn't. So it's even developing countries that are taking the lead and India has a lot to catch up on. I'm sorry, uh, I have another question. Uh, when you were talking about, this is in response to what you said about the Accessible India campaign. So many of us sometimes feel that a particular term that we use may be insensitive or so what my question basically is what is the right term to be used is it a person with disability is it differently abled is it viklang or divyang and why is it so which term is okay and which term is not so i think everybody will give you a different answer to that question and i can only give you what is my opinion and my opinion goes by what the human says that is persons with disabilities for well, the word differently abled, I particularly hate the term because I think that everybody is differently abled. You might be better at law, I might be better at economics, somebody else might be better at writing. So everybody is differently abled in that sense. I don't like the word divyang because I feel that uh, it kind of uh, belittles people by calling them divine. And it's the same thing as how for the lower caste, Gandhi had come up with this word called Harijan. And I think uh, it was it diverts from the topic basically. And I think. Instead of concentrating on creating new terminologies for people with disabilities, the government job is to give them the right kind of physical infrastructure, etc. And if you look at uh, disability overall also, disability worldwide has moved from a medical definition of disability, which basically meant that if I have articular process, I don't have muscles, bands and legs, if somebody has cerebral palsy, he has the problem, to a social model of disability. And what that basically means is that disability exists because of the barriers in society, both in terms of physical infrastructure or in terms of attitudes. So I think uh, that's about it, yeah. And I would like to call people disabilities, persons with disabilities. Uh, so, I mean, just adding on to that, if apart from the fact that, you know, through these measures, the government may try to uh, grant the rights that they deserve to, to the persons with disabilities, don't you think the government also has the additional responsibility of changing the attitude or mindset of people and which is why people which is why probably any leader would probably want to use that term whether it is gandhi or the current prime minister if they use the term harijan or divyang they might it it probably is an attempt from their no, side i think the attitudes of people with disabilities totally need to change and that's why i congratulated the government something like the accessible india campaign will totally change attitudes of people towards people with disabilities providing employment opportunities for people with disabilities will totally change attitudes because people realize that a person with a disability in my family can be a breadwinner too and he can contribute, he or she can contribute economically too. I don't think, uh, and we can agree to disagree, but I don't think uh, a terminology like the Vyang will change attitudes, but uh, attitudes need to change. India right now as for the census is 2.21% of India's population is disabled, whereas WHO says that 15% of the world's population is disabled. I'm not trusting WHO, I don't think 15% is disabled, but I don't think as little as 2.21% is also disabled. And one of the main, main reasons why just 2.1% of aspiric courts is disabled is because uh, there's a social stigma attached and people don't even want to declare that they have people with disabilities in their families. So I think if the, the reasoning behind, uh, I'm not sure whether that's true, but if the reasoning behind the Vyang was to change attitudes, I think the, they are attacking the right problem but with the wrong medicine. I have two questions to ask you. Sure, go ahead. Uh, so first of all, do you award organizations that are accessible no we are we have more organizations that are taking an initiative and employing people with disabilities yeah so what is the criteria like how do you determine it's just oh, there's a completely independent duty that actually decides the winners and uh, it's shared by this former secretary general of Vicky called dr Rajiv kumar and uh, we have mr george Bryan who, who got kind cricket to india we have karuna nandi who's a lawyer we have mahima called from twitter and we have the ci the director from ci mr jawad i'm not even allowed to vote uh, to stay silent throughout the meeting and applications from all over the country come. So what is the criteria only employing persons with disabilities? The primary focus is employing people with disabilities and of course there's a huge form that those organizations need to fill. Applications this year are closed but I'll share the link with you next year when. Okay. So how, what have you found out like amongst organizations that are employing people with disabilities, <coughs> what is the most prevalent disability and what disability are least represented in the workforce? Okay, so. Uh, 
one of the interesting things I found was that, uh, and I'm glad you brought out this question because this is something we've not discussed at all uh, throughout this session today, is that uh, the hospitality industry is really taken a lead in employing people with disabilities. Uh, have any of you here visited Lemontry Hotels? Yeah? Did you see anybody with a disability when you were there? Okay, I'm surprised because 20, Lemontry actually has a vision of 25% of their employees being disability, uh, people with disabilities. Uh, over 10% are already people with disabilities and it's uh, and it's all kinds of disabilities that they're hiring. They're even hiring people with Down syndrome, which is considered one of the most trickiest disabilities to really uh, hire. And uh, they're using them for all kinds of work, right, from restaurants to room service to cleaning, etc. And there's also a career progression for people with disabilities at elementary. Then there are other companies that have, have come up with uh, interesting uh, studies, of, uh, interesting uh, experiments on disability and made business models around disability. For example, there's this uh, courier company in Bombay, it's called Medical Couriers, which actually realized that uh, when there's a courier boy who's actually going to deliver a courier to any customer, he doesn't actually have to communicate with the customer in any way, he just needs to navigate the map and reach the customer. So what they realize is that why not have speech and hearing impaired people and give them phones with maps enabled on them. And uh, they're working magic, they reach customers in as much time as anybody else, if not more. Uh, so these are two examples they give. Another example I would give is the IT industry. The IT industry is another industry that, uh, for example, SAP has a huge population of pe people with autism who they're hiring for programming and they're realizing that people with autism are actually better than others in the programming. So it's worked magic for them. Uh, then there are a lot of manufacturing companies that are hiring a lot of hearing impaired people. And the reason why they started hiring these hearing impaired people is because these are normally noisy areas where there's a lot of disturbance. And when you hire somebody who's hearing impaired, they can concentrate better compared to others. So companies started off as these all these initiatives are CSR initiatives, but what they realize is that there's a business model around these projects. And uh, it's worked magic for these organizations and hopefully it will create a ripple effect on the rest of the economy. The second question I had was that uh, recently there was this Jira Ghosh incident where she was asked to devote the plane on account of her disability. How has your experience been with airlines? Well, I've actually written an article that's going to get published in school later this week and I'll send you the link. Okay. But uh, the challenge for people with disabilities in uh, airlines uh, unfortunately is quite uh, sad and unfortunate. So I move around in an automatic wheelchair as you would have noticed. and. Uh, Airlines don't really know how, to, airlines and even the airport security doesn't really know how to react to a person with their disability, especially with a battery, because if you're, they don't understand a battery, I don't know whether I have to plug in my battery onto my wheelchair, take it or take it separately, because whatever I do, the CISF will be unhappy with that. Uh, and uh, even though Jija Ghosh was a challenge with an airline, most of the recent challenges have actually been with the CISF. I don't know whether you heard of Aditya Mehta, who's a parasitalist who in the last two months has actually been stopped twice with his, uh, uh, his parallel like being removed. So challenges are difficult and what the problem gets added because uh, there are three forces really that are uh, at work when you want to fly. One is the airline, second is the airport and third is the security forces. And whatever complaint you have, there's no central agency that looks at those complaints and all three of them keep blaming each other and that's why justice is almost never served. And Deja Ghosh went to court most people don't end up going to court. I've missed so many flights because uh, it took them so long to figure out whether uh, my battery is safe or not. And I would be transferred to the next flight, but I've missed out on meetings because of that. So then there's this another lady called Anita Gai who was actually made to crawl out of a plane and that was an Air India plane earlier this year because uh, the airline could not organize a wheelchair for her. And when she started fighting against the airline, the airline blamed it on the airport, the airport blamed it on the airline. So. We don't even know where the blame lies and uh, again here yeah, there's no legal protection in that sense. So like you mentioned that somebody has been forced to crawl out of a plane. Do you think it's time that the disabled people in the in India form some sort of an identity? Because if you look at it, most disadvantaged groups have identity politics in place and that is how the demands are met. Do you think if disabled people within India let go of their social stigma, they accept their disabilities, and they come together to form a group. Would political parties listen to them more? Would such I, I actually have a theory on this too, and I've written an op-ed on this also a couple of months back. One of the main reasons why disability in India has not really become uh, an 
election factor or a vote bank is because uh, unlike most identities that are uh, vertical identities, right? Uh, I mean, caste is a vertical identity that's passed from your parents to you. Religion is a vertical identity that's passed from your parents to you. Disability and the LGBT community are two communities that are horizontal identities. Because if a parent is disabled, child might not be disabled, or if a parent is able bodied, a child might not be disabled. And that's why these are two communities that don't really get ghettoized in a particular uh, region or a particular area. And because they don't get ghettoized in a particular area, they are dispersed across the country and they never become a sufficient enough vote bank in a first past the post system for any politician to take very seriously. And I think uh, in the first path of post system, it is difficult to make uh, disability an important electoral factor. Unless you have something like Donald Trump who starts imitating people with disabilities and suddenly it becomes front page news and Hillary Clinton has to keep talking about disability to attack Trump. So maybe we should first have a can primacy or candidate who starts imitating some of the disability. It might help us. Any other question? Uh, another question that I, that should sure. be in my mind. So, what do you think of driving licenses being given to persons with disabilities in India? Have you had any experience in this? Have you? Because usually the authorities are not really conducive to grant driving licenses if there is any disability. So, I personally have had no experience for this, but I've heard of various people who had both good and bad experiences. And the reason I have not had any experience is because I'm quite short. I cannot drive, so I've not tried getting a driving license. But I think uh, it again comes down to the same thing as aviation. The biggest problem in India, and I think this is not a problem in disability, but just in the way the bureaucracy, etc. functions, by bureaucracy having police, IS, officers, or any government employee at any particular area, is that there are no standard operating procedures that they have to follow in most places, and that's why they follow their own judgment. I think it's time that we have such strict standard operating procedures in aviation, in making driving licenses, etc that uh, subjectivity and uh, personal biases and choices of uh, these bureaucrats goes down and uh, if you have a particular disability and if you fulfill the criteria through which you can have a driving license, you should get a driving license. Thank you. Yes, Rahul. Uh, sir, if you follow the recent news, there is a Paralympic Games. So, we have won two gold medals, one silver and one bronze. So, but like what I am following it from the very first day to the last day. But it is, it is really sad that uh, half of the people, half of the people of our country, more than half of the people, don't have any knowledge about those people. Like Devinder Jha has, like he won the second gold medal in the Paralympic, which is one of the biggest things. As being a, like it is equivalent to Olympics and many of the people don't have that knowledge that what is a Paralympic game. So sir, like such kind of less awareness, uh, what do you have to say about like these people are also like they have done what uh, what our basic natural we call a able person can do. They have uh, like they had uh, they had qualified and they had win such kind uh, those gold medals which are like able normal able person uh, can't been able to win. So but still they are like they are less popular and they like. They came to the focus in all the news for the few time, few minutes, and then they like they again go to the attack. No, it is quite sad and unfortunate. And in fact, uh, the Paralympics in India were not even being telecast live on TV this time. I don't know whether you know about that. And uh, it was only after the disabled community in India really uh, fought about this that uh, Sony Entertainment finally decided to telecast the highlights for two hours every day. So it is quite sad and it is quite unfortunate, but. Uh, and in countries like UK, US, or various other European countries too, Paralympians become big stars and celebrities in their own right. And uh, but I don't really have an answer to this. Yeah, Sachin Tendulkar gave a Ferrari to everyone who won an Olympic model, to, Olympic medal to the Paralympians. He gave some cheap mobile phone. So it's quite sad. But yeah, I don't have an answer to this. I'm sorry. I think uh, no, but. Uh, when attitudes towards disability change, I think all this will also start changing. And uh, at the same time, I think we should also be happy that some focus was there on by Olympians this thing. Deepa Marik has become quite a rock star now. Any other questions? 